Hello, my name is Daniel Hindi. Today we're going to talk about the 10 steps needed to make sure you develop and deploy out your app in the wild and stick around to the end, there's a bonus round. Now hopefully you watched our previous video on the five things you need to consider before you're building your app, but this is actually getting it out and running. So without further ado, let's get started. Before we continue, make sure you like and subscribe to make sure you stay updated with our latest content. So this is an extremely important step that I have to train all my clients to make sure that they know what to anticipate and how to see measurable progress so that their app actually sees the light of day. You'll see a lot of different content out there telling you how to do this and they're all correct. They're all flavors of the right way of doing it. The truth of the matter is, is understand the steps needed so that you can cater it to your process. So that brings me to point number one. Always set clear goals. What are you out to achieve? What are the problems you're trying to solve? And use that as your North Star. It's very easy once you get started to get lost in the weeds, get sidetracked with bells and whistles and the other features that aren't mission critical to your goal. The first thing you really need to do is set those clear and measurable goals so that you can make sure that you are aiming towards them constantly you will spend far too much time in the weeds dealing with what if scenarios that really may not even matter. Make sure you set those clear goals and make sure you're constantly using that as your North Star. After you've achieved, achieved those goals, you can go back and, and add in any feature that you want. But step number one is set those goals and achieve them. Step number two is a wireframe. Now, what does this mean? If you were to build a house, you don't go start breaking ground and building your house right there and then. What you do is you write down blueprints on what is expected. Now that you've gone to your engineers and your architects and you've, you've said, hey, I want a five bedroom house, a three bedroom house, whatever it may be, they start writing down these uh, uh, schematics that are blueprints because it's much easier to move or to change on paper than it is in real life. Software is exactly the same thing. You want to make sure that you wireframe out your goals, you wireframe out your the, the layout of your app, the journey of your app, and you make sure that those meet your requirements because it's so much easier and faster to adjust right there and then. Wireframes are exactly what they sound like. They could be on a whiteboard, they could be on a napkin, on a piece of paper, but they're just wireframes, pencil, meant to illustrate the components of your app and the layout maybe of, of some screen, but it's not meant to be a one-to-one -one relationship with how the actual app is going to look. It's more about the structure and flow of things. Once you get that solid, you can move on to the next step, which is point number three, high fidelities. Again, with the building a house analogy, once you have those um, uh, blueprints set up, you want a 3D rendering of it so you can see the house in a virtual environment. It's not a real house that you can live in, but it's a very good representation of what you expect the outcome to be so you can hold your contractors liable and responsible to achieving that goal. Same thing with software. Once you've established your wireframes, you make sure that you have a high fidelity rendering. This is where it looks very pretty. It looks, it's a, a picture perfect match of what you're expecting your app to be at the very end. So that uh, your colors match, uh, padding, margins, layouts, everything matches to a T. The only difference is this is a picture of an app versus what they're building, which is a real functional app. But again, even at that point, moving things around, understanding the user journey, uh, uh, changing the flow so that the, so, so that the user has the best experience uh, is easier done now than later. Before we continue, if you have a horror story about software development you tried in the past by not following this process, leave me a comment below. I'd love to hear those horror stories. Unfortunately, there's some pain to it, but sometimes they're pretty funny. So I'd be really interested if you left me a comment. Point number four, technical specifications. You need to make sure that your development team writes a tech spec. Think of this as uh, in the building a house analogy, your civil engineering. There's a lot of things that uh, are baked into your um, app or in your house in this case, that is electrical, plumbing, uh, ventilations, things of that nature that sort of the inner workings of how uh, it's done. And sometimes logistically, 
it, it makes sense. It'll save you a lot of time and money. If, for example, on top of the kitchen, you put a bathroom because the plumbing can easily be connected to the second story. While in the designs, you can make it, make them completely far apart. The engineers come in and say, well, we could do that. It's gonna cost you a lot more money. It's cheaper if you actually align things. Uh, and it gives you another insight on the inner workings of it. So same thing with your app. When your uh, developers go in and you take a look at it, they look at the technical challenges, not just the visual challenges, not the, just the experience, it's just the, the logistics behind it as well. And this is very important to understand now and see sometimes they can find you ways to achieve your goals that'll save you months and thousands of dollars if we listen to them now. And if not, then you can weigh out your options and say, no, the experience is much more important than to shave off some cost um, doing it the more efficient way. But it's very important to do this before we even begin. Point number five. Make sure that you assess um, what services, what uh, um, products are out there that you could potentially purchase instead of building. Uh, continuing with our home analogy, you can get a carpenter to build out your kitchen, your cabinets, your, drawer, your doors and windows. Why? There are existing components that you could just purchase and build your kitchen and bathrooms with. So it'll save you a lot of time and money if you just go and purchase them and use them as is. Some of them are modifiable a little bit, but it's so much cheaper to just buy something that's already made and built and just use it in there. Same thing when you're building your software. And there are many services that are out there that do common um, uh, functionalities and common services that everybody needs uh, from analytics to uh, uh, push notifications to hosting your, your app and things, things of that nature. From design to hosting, there's a bunch of tools and services that are out there. Make sure that you assess those and see what works for you and purchase versus build. Oh, is if you could buy it and just be done with it, you know the product is working, you know if there's anything wrong with it, it has a warranty, you can just go back to the manufacturer. Same thing with software. Make sure that you can use anything that's reusable and then build only what you have to. Point number six, this is where we actually start developing. Now this is extremely important to make sure that you take off a chunk of your massive project and you start chipping away at it and you want to make sure that there are measurable milestones that you can hit within a small amount of time as possible so that you can measure progress and measure it against a timeline to make sure that you're hitting uh, your deadlines. A lot of this can be uh, helped and optimized if you learn uh, project management systems, agile development, uh, Scrum, for example, is extremely popular among software developers. Uh, it would do you well if you learn those methodologies so that you could best manage your project to have measurable and transparent steps so that you can see progress and see when you're actually going to uh, go to market with your product. Number seven, Quality assurance, it's extremely important that you test out your application specifically on mobile platforms between iOS, Android, potentially PWA, between phones and tablets. There's a massive array of options that your application could be deployed to and you wanna make sure they work uh, online, offline and so on. And so quality assurance, well, uh, many people when they first start say, why do I need a QA resource? Why am I paying for this? Uh, shouldn't the developers just develop and not make any bugs in their code, not any mistakes? Well, that's true in Utopia, but in the real world, developers write bugs and they're notoriously bad at finding their own bugs. This is where you bring in a QA. Developers call them the destroyer. A Q good QA person can come in and find some edge case where the app will break, but you can fix it before your customers find these bugs. So it's extremely important not to undermine the QA process. Eight, make sure that you deploy. Now, when you deploy for the very first time, uh, you're not worried about backwards compatibility. So you go to market and you put, you put it out there, you're worried about uptime. So you wanna keep good visibility that uh, your application is up and it's functioning for your uh, customers. There are a lot of software out there that you could use to make sure that the uh, app is healthy and uh, the software is responsive. Um, however, subsequent deployments for that second deployment, that second iteration, that new feature that you're deploying in, 
could have something called regression, which means something that used to work now stopped working. So when you deploy, you always want to go back and, and redo those steps, especially QA, to make sure that regression hasn't failed. So when you deploy it out there, your customers see nothing but the best. Number nine, make sure you can measure success. Have KPIs, key performance indicators, to know that your app is performing the way it's expected to perform. Now, this isn't just in terms of speed, even though that's that's a very good API to have in terms of actual performance, uh, uh, speed, and reliability. But are users adapting to your app? Are you are users downloading your app? Are they keeping the, your app? Are they reusing their app? You need the analytics to make sure that you can go back in and see who are new users, who are repeat users, what's the length of time that they're spending, where are they spending it? So having these analytics to help you measure success is extremely important. Number 10, make sure you gather feedback from your users. Your very first launch, you may have done some market research, you may have asked some buddies, but it's really a lot of uh, intuition from your end. But once you've deployed the very first time, now you should have customers to ask them. Because at the end of the day, as much as you'd probably hate to hear this, your opinion isn't what matters. It's your customers' opinions. And now that you have customers, ask them. Don't be shy. It's okay. Customers actually like being asked. And those who don't, don't mind it, they just will ignore you. But those who want to participate and are vested in your success will come back and give you good feedback. Now you need to mine that feedback to see what's fear of change, what's fear of a cost increase, um, but you can ask your questions in ways to get honest feedback from your customers, and then that will help you prioritize what feature you should work on next. You may have had something in, in your mind that is the most important thing to work on next, but if your customers don't say so, save your money, spend it on what they want so you can retain them in your software. So once they're a customer, they're always a customer and then they don't leave and churn. So here's a bonus round. Once you've launched your app, what's next? Well, if you have the best software on the planet that nobody knows about, it doesn't matter. So you need to market your app so you get eyeballs and interest and you get visitors to your site, visitors to your app and visitors become users and users become paid members. So it's extremely important to not blow your entire budget on software development and leave some for marketing because if you have the best app on the planet that nobody knows about, it doesn't matter. After you retain your customers, you wanna make sure that you have customer support so that you don't churn your customers, that they stay there and they feel valued and listened to anytime they have suggestions or a problem or a friction point, that there's somebody there to help them. Now, whether that's you in the beginning or you hire a staff to do it for you, it's extremely important to anticipate that post-launch. The third thing that you may want to anticipate somewhere in the near future after you launch is a sales force. Now, once you get eyeballs with marketing coming in, sometimes that's not enough to sustain your business. You want to make sure that you have a sales force that can go out and get you customers. And this is the outbound effort. That's extremely important to the success of any business. I hope this video helped you understand what does it take to actually get an app out and running and in the wild. And good luck, and here's to your success.